Hello, this is Al Vanderberg, uh, host of West Michigan Issues and Impact. Uh, today, I am very pleased to have as my guest, Senate Majority Leader Arlen Mikoff. And welcome, Arlen. Thank you. It's Thank a, you, Al. I'm very uh, pleased to have you on the show today. And uh, Arlen, you have been involved in just about every facet of local and state government over many, many years now. And uh, I know we'll, we'll really be eager to hear some of what it's like to be the, the Senate Majority Leader, but I kind of like to start with uh, your beginnings and maybe why you got into government to begin with and uh, maybe just a little bit about your time as a township supervisor and how that transitioned on to bigger and better things. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Thanks for having me here, Al. I'm, I began at the township level and actually a little earlier than that. I had been on a local school board, a, a private school where my children went to school and been a school board president and some folks there encouraged me to to be a little more active, uh, given the fact that I was able to, to lead people in a certain way to, to come to conclusions and, and move organizations forward. So uh, I got appointed to the Board of Review in my local township. Uh, it's not always a pleasant task when you're talking to people <laughs> about their property taxes and what the value of their property is. But and then, and then I ran for township trustee. And I think it's interesting when I talk to most folks about this. I, so I won my first real election by 14 votes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, for, against a couple other folks who were very well financed and, and uh, much better name ID in the township than, than okay. I had. And uh, began town and also was the township supervisor in Olive Township. Yeah. So that uh, then blossomed into other things as we began to do some great things in Olive Township and, and organize uh, the, the way that um, uh, the economy allowed us and, and grew the township a little bit and uh, also maintained the very rural character of Olive Township. And I ran for state representative, and it was a, a, an eight-way primary, and I won just about 30% in an eight-way primary. And I served two terms in the House of Representatives, one as assistant leader, and uh, uh, in 2010, I was elected to the, to the Michigan Senate, and I was then uh, elected by my peers to be the floor leader, which is a different task than, than leader, but floor leader is basically making the trains run on time, make all the legislation move between committee and the House and the and the governor in the proper and legal fashion so that it's all done correctly. And then uh, this last term, uh, I was reelected in my final term in the legislature. And uh, that uh, the job of majority leader is uh, significantly different than most others. Uh, while I have responsibilities to the 270,000 people in Ottawa County that I represent, I make decisions for the 10 million people right. that live in Michigan. So sometimes those are in conflict. Right. So you and I connected, I think, when I first started as county administrator, I kind of made the round of all the cities and townships and introduced myself, and then you and I worked together on some issues related to the Fillmore Complex, which is right in Olive Township. And so I've kind of been, had a front seat to see your career and work with you from a county issues level, as you've been in the House and Senate. Uh, how would you maybe first uh, compare being in the House and the Senate? What are those, how are those experiences different? Uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about being majority leader and how's that different from being a senator or what does that add as far as responsibility? Well, I think that uh, what I, I joke about it and say the differences in the House and the Senate. When I was in the House, I was in the minority. Okay. Uh, we really literally didn't have a lot of input on, on what the policy and procedures and budgets were going to be. I mean, we, we did make some very, very uh, significant changes. We, had, we were 43 members of the House Republicans and we actually did change the budget scheme and the way things were going to be done and live within our means and we got the Democrats to come along. So it was a rather interesting uh, thing that we were able to do. Um, also, the, the difference in the House and the Senate is in the House there, uh, it's, it's more collegial, it's more jovial, it's more open because there's 110 members and they're all talking to each other about things they're working on, things that are important to their communities. And in the Senate, uh, I should say, excuse me, back up in the House, when they vote and they put some up on the board, the board can stay open as long as they want to get all the votes put up there. Mm. Uh, contrast with, with the Senate, which is a much smaller body, only 38 members. And each member has at least one staff person on the floor with them. And when we vote, we have one minute to vote. Oh. So we, we, we're on a shot clock, as it were. And uh, so there's not as much of... of collegiality going on at that point because you really have to pay attention to what's going on. Know what, uh, if you aren't on the committee that's bringing forth the information for which you, you're asked to vote, 
and you've got to make sure that you've done your homework with other members of that committee or your staff to know how you're going to vote because you're only going to get one minute when they put it up on the board. Okay. And then in the Senate, actually you held a major leadership position before a majority leader because you were the floor leader in the Senate. Right. And you were kind of the circuit breaker for legislation to get to the floor? Is that kind of how that worked? Yeah, uh, the office there, I had great staff. It's a, it's a big logistical operation. When material gets introduced, a bill gets introduced, gets assigned to a committee, so we make sure that's done in, in the right way. Sometimes the sponsor of the bill wants it to go to a certain committee. It doesn't always work that way, but a lot of times it does. And then when it comes out of committee and comes to the floor, then it's my job to make sure that it's placed in front of everybody properly okay. and, and voted uh, either it's concurring in something the House did or sending something over to the House for them to concur and on to the governor for his signature. Okay. And with becoming majority leader, all of a sudden you had an extra office and more staff and probably less time to do everything. How, what's <laughs> that been like? Um, well, as my wife will attest to, I'm, I only get home about six or seven days a month, and this happens to be one <laughs> of them, so thank you, Al. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so she can watch me on TV, okay? <laughs> this is great. Um, so th the business of the Senate is about 250 people. It's like a small operation between the Legislative Services Bureau, all the drafting people, the folks that work on documentation, and all of the staff of everybody works for the Senate Majority Leader's Office. And okay. they have, they're at-will employees. So the, each member can choose their own staff, but then we work with them and they actually all, the, the paychecks are cut from, basically from the Senate Majority Leader's Office. So it's a small city okay. of which you're running. And, uh, and you can imagine, like any small operation or family business, there's issues, personnel issues, there's uh, legislative issues. Sometimes there's member-to-member -member issues in which you need to resolve. Sure. So a lot of it is, is coaxing along and leading folks along to a place where they can get to, to find solutions for Michigan's problems. And so it's a, it's a different role, uh, yeah. one I, I re really, really cherish. Uh, I, I can't imagine that, as we talked about Olive Township, uh, a guy from one of the most rural parts of the state, one, one stoplight, no Burger King, and most of the township doesn't have cable, I have this job and I get to sit with the governor every Tuesday and talk about, and the Speaker of the House, and talk about the stuff that's good for Michigan. And I think it's a great American story because that kind of stuff only happens in America. Well, and, and being from Ottawa County, it's an Ottawa County story too because you represent the values of Ottawa County every single day in Lansing. And we're very proud of that. Thank you. So you mentioned issues. That's a kind of a nice segue, I think, into, so uh, it seems like there's one massive issue, and that's roads. Mm -hmm. And it seems like everything else is talked about relative to when roads gets done and some of those things. Maybe give us the landscape on, uh, well, let's start with roads. What's happening with that? Certainly. Uh, there is a deal on the table right now that uh, some have walked away from. Uh, I will sign that deal today. The governor okay. will sign it, and the speaker will sign it. So that leaves out one person. Um, and it, the bipartisan plan that the Senate sent over to the House in July, uh, we sent it over there fully knowing and intending that there was going to be compromise if they wanted to buy, uh, continue on a bipartisan theme. So we put that plan out there. We've been working since July with House members and House leadership to put something together. And we basically come up with a very, very good plan, simple to explain. And, uh, and we believe for a long-term solution fixes the roads. And I'll, if it's okay, I'll lay that plan out. Oh, that'd out. be great, that? yeah. So in front of us is we needed about $1.2 billion a year for 10 or 12 years to get our roads back to just good. We're not talking about great. We're talking about 80% good, okay? And uh, it's, it's important to remember how we got here. 17 years ago when they did the last gas tax change or increase, they didn't add inflation on there. And if we would have added inflation for the last 17 years, we would have about a billion dollars more a year to spend. Oh. That's the, the compounding power of inflation. So what we did is put together a plan that says, all right, we know we have revenue in our budget that we can redirect. So we're going to redirect about $400 million in our current budget. We're going to take registration fees and super heavy trucks, and they're going to be increased so that that generates about $400 million. And then put gas tax uh, raise the gas tax about a nickel, maybe it's, I think it's maybe slightly around six cents, and that will raise about $400 million for $1.2 billion. Now, when we build roads, we generally go out and bond, which is like getting a mortgage to build these sure. roads, and anticipated revenue. So we're going to sunset all those new taxes at some period in the future when we know that we have enough money has been generated to pay for the bonds. 
So okay. it's not a tax. The joke is, right, you put a tax on it, it never ends. Right. This one will end. Okay. okay? Uh, we think that's a very, very fair. Um, again, if you would have been paying this over 17 years. It just so happens because we didn't do it that way, we now have to catch up. Right. Now, of the new taxes and fees, it's about $800 million to the citizens of Michigan. That's significant. But if you break it down into uh, average driver that gets 20, 20 to 25 miles a gallon, 20,000 miles a year they drive, that's about an average driver in Michigan, okay. some fluctuation of that. Uh, it's about 150 to $200 a year of increase. Now, if you divide it by 50, it's about three or $4 a week. So the, while that 800 million sounds like a lot of new money, it is, but again, incrementally, you've been, you would have been paying pennies and nickels along the way over 17 years, and now you're gonna be paying it in dollars. Well, so and you're going to save some money in car repairs, I would think. Yes, certainly. I've heard a lot of that, and, and maybe you've had the same thing when I'm in a room and I talk to folks and say, you know, how many of you have had damage to your car? A few of them raised their hands, and I yeah. said, but more importantly, how many of you have had damage to your wife's car? Right. And everybody <laughs> raises their hands and says, oh, no, I get it. I, I, this is a problem that needs to be solved. Right. And we're doing our best to be responsible. Nobody likes to raise taxes. Nobody is taking great glee over doing this, but knowing that we have to solve this problem and find a way to do it and live within our budget means so we don't bankrupt the budget as well. Right. I think the other thing, as I talk to people, that somehow they've missed over the years is just the fact that when gas prices shot way up, they assumed that somehow the state was collecting all kinds of money for roads. And what's the, ro what's the matter? Why can't they live within their means? But what they don't quite understand is that when the price shot way up, consumption went down dramatically. Correct. And, I mean, there's a lot of road agencies that have less than what they had 10 years ago to spend to fix roads. And of course, as gas goes up, the price of asphalt and uh, building roads goes up. And so it's almost been like the perfect storm where you have revenues going down and expenditures going up at the same time. Yeah. yeah. I think it's important for your viewers to know that when there's sales tax on gasoline, about two thirds of that goes to um, revenue sharing, or excuse me, a third goes to revenue sharing, local governments and about just slightly less than two thirds goes to schools. A very, very small portion of that rolls into uh, the general fund. Right. Okay? So the sales tax on gas, 6% on gas, uh, the, the over above, I'm sorry, I'll back up. Under proposal A, we went from four cents to two, cent, two cents additional. Right. So in that two cents additional, that raises about a billion dollars. It's divided differently and most of it does not go to roads. Right, yeah. And that's, I think, what we saw with the last uh, statewide ballot proposal. Mm -hmm. People were just confused. And what they wanted to hear was, everything goes to roads. And I think... It doesn't. At this exactly. Point. And I think that's been uh, part of the problem. So I have to just mention, give you a kudo for the State Parks Passport Program. <laughs> I mean, I think that has just turned out fantastic. I think uh, it was a hard battle for you. I think you were the one who thought that up and got that done. And and so uh, what's uh, kind of the feedback you get from that, from yeah. DNR and, and all that? Uh, I, actually, one of the few freshmen that got a bill through in minority when I was in the House, but we, we put this plan together with a citizens group, and it modeled a couple of other states that did this in their recreation passport. And uh, under the former administration, the state park sticker that you would put on your window would have gone up to almost $40. Uh, so what we did is said, look, we're going to lower the price and make it easier for you to get it. So now you go to the, when you are renewing your license, you get asked, do you want that passport sticker? It goes right on your license plate. It's been wonderful. So the change we needed, at least 17% of the people in Michigan to buy the sticker. We have somewhere near 26% of the people uh -huh. now. So we are generating funds. And it's important to know from the general fund, we had not put any money in state parks in over 10 years. And now, so we were about three to $400 million behind on bridge repairs, buildings that fell down, some things like that. And, and I, I think it's important for our citizens when they go there to have a great experience at our state parks, but more importantly, people who come from out of state. Well, if they don't have a good experience at our state park, clean bathrooms, good parking lots, well lit, all of those types of things, they're not gonna come back. Right. So this is a way that we actually lowered the price, I think it's like $11 now, and you put it on your plate, and now we're working on a second phase of that, that you could have it on your phone. So. In this case, if you wanted to buy a sticker like that and give it to your kids, there isn't a way to do it. Hmm. So now we're going to find a way for you to, maybe your maybe grandparents want to buy it for their grandkids, a different way that maybe you can have that pa recreation passport on your person as well. That's a great idea, yeah. 
So you have been a proponent of some significant conservative legislation since you've been in office. Uh, I think of some of the helmet law uh, legislation, uh, motorcycle helmet law, that were basically uh, bikers aren't required to wear the helmets anymore, and some of the gun legislation that's gone through. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, on the helmet legislation, that's basically a, it's a liberty issue, and I, and um, but I tell everybody you can ride without a helmet, but I wish you wouldn't. Right. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people will say, well, then I shouldn't have to wear seat belts. And I'll make the point here. Your federal dollars on transportation come back to the state of Michigan based on the fact if you have a seatbelt law. Okay. They don't on if you have a helmet law. Okay. Okay, that's the difference there. So bikers are free to do that. But again, every chance I get when somebody asks me this question, I say, yes, you can, but please don't. Right. Uh, it, significant risk. Uh, even if you're riding with a helmet and you're in some sort of crash, whether with an auto or something else, anytime you're going over 35 miles an hour, it's probably going to be a good chance there will be a head, head injury. Right. So wearing a helmet is better for you. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And on gun legislation, I, just, I simply believe the Constitution is correct. It is an individual right. Um, and it, all the jokes aside and all the things aside, you are personally responsible for your own security. Right. Right. Because if a police officer responds to some place where you're being threatened, it's always after the fact. Sure. Right? The opportunity for you to defend yourself and have that right to defend yourself should not be infringed. Right. I'm kind of curious on your take on term limits. I can say that uh, these happened during my career, and I think it's been a bad thing uh, for the state. Uh, I think that uh, uh, in some ways we've seen uh, power go from the legislature to lobbyists and to bureaucrats. Uh, I think that we get somebody really good in office and they can't stay very long. And it seems to me that democracy works just fine if the citizens pay attention and hold their public officials accountable. And I, I know it's hard to find people that will say, yeah, I voted for term limits. But I can honestly say I did not. And I did not because I'm serious about my voting right and I'm serious about keeping track of people who are in office and uh, voting for them if I think they've done a good job and voting against them if I think they have not. And so I, I'm, I'm curious, A, what's your take on this? And I know viewers might think it's self-serving, but, but honestly, I think I've seen too many really good legislators go, and then we don't always replace them with good legislators mm -hmm. because we keep that mill turning so quick. And, and in some cases, I wonder how they have time to find the bathroom before they're out of office, especially in the House where they only have three two-year terms. Right. And so A, maybe first your take on it, and then maybe B would be, are there any initiatives to maybe address this? So, um, so I'll, I'll take um, part of the opposite side. I voted for term limits, but I think when it was sold to us, we believe it was also going to be the folks in Washington, and that was proven right. not to be true. That's right? true. So I think that a number of people, even if you ask them now, they would say, yeah, I voted for that, but maybe I shouldn't have, okay, given what's going on. Right. And a couple of analogies I'll share with you. We have about a $50 billion budget in the state of Michigan. So I had someone explain it to me this way. And, uh, before I do that, I'll back up and say, I'm a creature of term limits. The folks that left office before me gave me those opportunities to run sure. for office as well. So I think there's a, there's a part of this that we do need term limits. The length of them could be different. Okay. So let's start there. But if you have a $50 billion company and the people that are investing in your company, you went to them and said, hey, every six or 10 years, we're going to take out the entire board of directors and put in new people who haven't done this before. Right. How likely are you to invest in that company? And the second um, analogy would be, if you're going to have some sort of heart surgery, you would get somebody who's been doing it for 20 years, not the person that just came out <laughs> of med school. True. This is the only job where experience doesn't matter. And I, w I would argue that the opposite is true. Right. Uh, you, especially in the house, you. Your first two years, you're trying to find all the rooms that you need to go to, and make sure your staff is helping serve constituents. The second two years, you're starting to get good at your job and understand what it is you're, you're doing. And the third two years, you're looking for your job, your next job, because you're about out the door. And right. that's when you're the most effective, when you've actually known how to work with people. It has a lot to do with relationships and building those relationships and trust so that you can work together cooperatively. Right. As in... Is there an opportunity to change term limits? There's been a couple of moves about it, and, and again, maybe it does sound self-serving, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, I learned from Pete Hoekstra that he said, look, everybody hates Washington, but they love Pete Hoekstra. They like their guy. Right. right? So That's people true. may say the same thing about Lansing. I don't like what they do. They're all a bunch of 
crooks or whatever, but my person, oh, I want them to serve forever. Right. So we have something that we've been discussing and maybe an option right now, uh, and we would have to go to the ballot to ask people about this, is extending term limits in some form or fashion. And, and I'll, I'll say it in this way. If you wanted to recall a, an elected official, there's a process of which you need to go through, get right. the number of signatures to have their name put on a ballot so you could remove them. Right. This option would say something like, if I wanted to serve another term or folks wanted me to serve another term, I would have to get the same number of signatures to put me on the ballot. Oh. So now it is an open seat, and you can vote for me if you want. If you don't vote for me and somebody else wins, then that person takes a seat. Oh. And that would be an extension of maybe one term for the Senate and maybe a couple more terms for the House, something like that. So okay. now people can actually say, yeah, I like my guy or gal, and I want them to serve again. So I can vote for them or I can help them collect signatures or do anything. And I think that's an option to put in front of the, the citizens. Yeah. One of the, one of the criticisms or frustrations with the Grand Home Administration, I think, was that uh, it was very infrequent, it seemed, that the Senate Majority Leader the Speaker of the House and the Governor would just get together and talk through things and try to figure out, you know, a path and maybe to resolve some difficult issues. And I'm just curious what your experience has been in the Snyder administration with that. Do you, the, the three of you get together fairly frequently? It, if it isn't every Tuesday, it's every other Tuesday. Oh, okay. In, any of the Speaker's office, my office, or the Governor's office. And you're right, we do talk about things, especially around budget time, how things are going and um, getting that completed on a, in a timely fashion. So you'll note under the Senate administration, it's been five years in a row on time, complete and balanced. So people know what, what it is is going to be in the state budget. Doesn't mean they like it. It's there's some certainty instead of waiting till a, a, a budget crisis happens. And it allows a lot of other planning and activity to occur in a Certainly. more orderly fashion. I, I had never remembered it being adopted before the third week of June or so even uh, in the past. And so that really was, was remarkable that you were all able to, to put that together and get that done. And, and to note uh, from the foreign administration to, to this one, uh, this governor is probably one of the only folks that if you asked him about his budget and said, if you change this or change that, uh, and then you sat through like a 30 minute meeting and at the end of the meeting, in his head he's been figuring it out and at the end of the meeting he could tell you what the change would be, what the impacts would be. Okay. He's that kind of smart. Wow. That's uh, and he's the same person that you see on TV as he is in a meeting, as he is when he's out talking to people. He's not a, there's no difference between his public life and his private life. That's exactly who he is. It's refreshing. Okay, I'm going to ask you a tough question that I get asked now and then, and I, it's difficult for me to answer. But what, if you look at your career in public service, what is that thing that you're most proud of, that you think is the most impactful? And then maybe what's the most difficult thing that you wish had gone a different way? Oh, interesting. Well, I've, I've been involved with a lot of great legislation, uh, labor legislation, right to work, prevailing wage, uh, uh, legislation that helps property owners that are, that are Lakeshore property owners, doing, uh, for doing owners uh, and, in terms of their property rights. But the one I am the most singly proud of is banning partial birth abortion. I have been uh, an advocate for adoption and for life for a long time, way before my political career ever started. And it goes all the way back to the fact that my mother chose life for me and placed me for adoption at a very, very young age, at six months. And I believe every human has that right. And I think it's listed in the Constitution in order. Remember how it goes? The life, pursuit of life. Life, liberty. Life is first, and I think right. it's there on yep, purpose. Absolutely. So that is the one of which I'm most proud. Okay. The one I wish it would have gone differently is um, a number of the budgets that we that we did in in lame duck or not lame duck excuse me when we're in the minority ah. really difficult choices most departments in the state got cut 15 to 20 percent we had cut education although it was only three percent everybody thought the world was going to end but we simply had to live within our means and the rhetoric surrounding that i think was very 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 difficult uh, i didn't like having to cast those votes didn't believe that's why i went to lansing cast votes to cut people's budgets but simply the, the funds weren't coming in because the economy was really struggling in Michigan. And just like a family, when you sit down at the table, you have to decide if you're gonna, everybody's gonna go to the movies or you're gonna go to Redbox. You have to make those choices differently. Right. And the state had to do those. Uh, but the rhetoric around that was really, really difficult. And I wish that would have been, I wish I would have done better personally. I wish it would have been um, portrayed differently. Well, and I think though that uh, people appreciate having people who treat the job as a stewardship and don't
try to kick the can down the road. Now, functionally, we only really have one government in America that can borrow its troubles away, and that's the federal government. And unfortunately, and they can print money too. We can't print. Money. They've done that to the point where we have a what a seventeen trillion dollar deficit, yeah. and someday that'll come home to roost. But uh, you know, I think that uh, everyone else has to bring their lunchbox to work and make those tough decisions and keep things in balance. So. Yeah. Um, I think we always look back and wish we'd have done things different, but I think, I think it's turned out well. Uh, okay, so here, this is, this is a fun one for me. I don't know how fun it'll be for you, but you've had a huge amount of success in the Senate, in the House, and uh, your name has started to be tossed around a little bit as maybe a gubernatorial candidate mm. uh, for the next uh, cycle, which begins in a couple years. And what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, first, I flattered my name gets mentioned in that, and if that's attributed to the success I've had, that's great. Um, so I've been joking about this. So I just say, you know, I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, I've seen some I've people. I've said who, that too. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I have. I've seen a lot of people who claim they're grown ups, and I'm not all that impressed. Uh, but I think that that uh, I, I'm focused mainly on getting this job, doing this job very, very well. It's an important job, and I don't take it lightly for the people I represent in the district and, and the entire state. Um, there, there's, and no one is more concerned about term limits in my <coughs> job after term limits than my wife. So I'm gonna make sure that uh, all the things that I do going forward are, are, are that. And I have to base a lot of things on, on what my kids say, what my heart says, what, what, is, what is it that my faith and my God is leading me to say what is next for me to do. And I'll take all those things in consideration, but I, I really don't know what I wanna do. Uh, it's been it's such a focused world to stay in this job and answer the phone calls and make decisions that I, it's not something that I, I think about all the time it's just something that I need to consider in the future but I'm not there yet right now I would think exactly with all the intense schedule that you have that that would be difficult uh, yeah. to do uh, well uh, we have just a brief time left I thought I'd ask you just briefly uh, the whole course or gamrat thing ethics and government uh, Kind of glad that's over. What, what's your take on that? Well, it was a very, very sad distraction. I think it did uh, damage the reputation of, of elected folks that are there doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, I, I believe that the MLive editorial about them running again was exactly correct. That was a great editorial, One yes. One word, and the word is no. Right. <laughs> it's curious to me that these two folks who think that fiscal responsibility is the most, it's the greatest and highest thing that you're supposed to do in that office, but yet ever having resigned and have been removed from office, they turn around and inject themselves in a special election, which costs the local governments more money. I right. find that very, very ironic. Yeah, very ironic, indeed. Um, I, I feel bad for their families and whatever happened, and, and we can all be absolved from a lot of things, but in the public eye, uh, you have a, a little bit higher standard, and people expect you to right. behave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much appreciate you having me here. Thank you.